Welcome, everyone. My name is Victor, a veteran. I'd like to express my gratitude to Meow's Cafe for inviting me to speak on a topic that is very close to my heart. There was a time in my life when I was penniless, had lost important family members, and was solely responsible for raising four kids. It's my hope that my story can offer you some strength. And thank you for being here with me today. In 2013, my brother, sister-in-law, sister, brother-in-law, sister, brother and my brother-in-law's mother were killed in a tragic accident while traveling down to the countryside. No one survived. The mother of my sister-in-law already passed away, and her father suffered a cerebral hemorrhage that led to his passing before the accident was even processed. My parents took my niece Faye, nephew James, children of my sister, and twin nieces April and Rose, children of my brother, back to our hometown. The man responsible for the accident had just been released from jail a year before. He was drunk driving. His parents went smashed and managed to pay less than $40,000 in settlement. The sister of my brother-in-law's mother came to our house causing trouble, demanding $5,000 more. At that time, Faye was 11, James was 3, and the twin girls were 5. My parents were elderly and heartbroken, and they lacked the energy to look after four children. I was 26 at the time, and a year after being discharged from the military, I gave up on settling into the work I was assigned and returned home. I took over an abandoned orchard and added it to the few acres of family land. I was, essentially, cut off from the world, dedicating my life to raising the kids and tending to the 15 acres of fruit garden. Fortunately, Faye was sensible and able to help look after her younger siblings during holidays. In early 2014, our small town was beginning to experiment with revitalizing its agricultural policies. I applied for land that measured over 90 acres. At that time, many people in the town went out to work and left plenty of fruit gardens abandoned. I found their contact information one by one and took over their land on credit. Soon, I got a total of 110 acres. I spent more than 30,000 on entertaining bureaucrats and giving them bribes to apply for the funds. However, the funds were under supervision and every expense had to go through ruthless auditing. At that point, I mainly focused on the open-air cherry field, which was semi-grown and about 70 acres in total. If there were no incidents, they were expected to bear fruits in 2016. In 2015, maggots broke out and all the open-air cherries in the area were affected. In previous years, the purchase price for the cherries was above $3 per kilogram, but that year, all the cherries were taken away by beverage plants and wineries at a few cents. After my siblings passed away, I didn't shed a tear. Not because my feelings for them were shallow, on the contrary, we were very close. It was because I didn't dare to cry. I was afraid that if I cried, my facade of holding it together would crumble, and my parents couldn't bear it. Then the four children would be done for. That year, during the daytime, truckloads of cherries were hauled away from gardens by drink factories and wine breweries, and I wept loudly at night, staring at dozens of acres of semi-grown cherries on my farm. In the fall of 2015, I tried to apply for a change of project and was refused. Every day, I camped in the village revitalization office. Wherever the leaders went, I followed. With a smile and flattering words, I wished every step they took, I could clean the road ahead for them. After insisting for two months, I finally got a promise for a project in 2016. Although the village revitalization office is now disbanded, I am still incredibly thankful to those officials. In 2016, I applied for and built four blueberry greenhouses. The work in the greenhouses was not tiring, but there was always too much to do. I wished I could work under the lamp in the greenhouse all day long. Fortunately, several of my army buddies in the city found out about this through our group chat. They came to help during weekends and even brought their families along. I let each of the four kids pick one of my buddies as their godfather. That year was the toughest one for me, and it was also when I had the most considerate niece, Faye, who was facing a problem. The problem was that she was too considerate. She was being bullied at school and didn't tell us because she didn't want us to worry. But she couldn't handle it herself, so she secretly ran to her parents' grave to lament. I went to talk to the teachers and the parents of the children who were bullying my niece. One of them was a local ruffian, a typical scoundrel who said that my niece deserved to be hit. When I objected, he threatened to hit me too. I lost my temper in the teacher's office. As everyone was in a daze, I beat that man so much that he hid in the corner of the office by the desk, using a chair to shield himself, and screamed in a shrill voice, What are you doing? What are you going to do? The school called the police, and I stayed at the police station for more than a day. Luckily, a policeman at the station was a good friend of my comrade, who was the brother of the town mayor. So, I was released the next day at noon and paid a small fine. The good news is that after that incident, no one ever dared to bully my niece again. In 2017, the income from our greenhouse finally improved, allowing the kids to live a bit better. 
We no longer had to buy them cheap clothes online or eat discounted food from the town supermarket all the time. That same year, I applied for project funding again and built five more greenhouses. We uprooted the cherry trees to develop open-air blueberries. In 2018, the blueberries in the first four greenhouses reached their fruitful period, and the latter five greenhouses and the open-air ones also started to generate income. Finally, we had the leisure money to take the kids out for meals and fun. That same year, my farm, as a local model, was reported to the Provincial Agricultural Department. After on-site inspections and evaluations, my farm became a Provincial Agricultural Research Pilot Unit. We received funding for expansion, established a team of agricultural college graduates, had experts follow up at any time, and the farm was transformed into an agritech company. Although I lost the decision-making power of the farm, the income increased. I no longer had to work so hard and had time to accompany the children. In 2019, I was selected as an excellent young agricultural talent in the province, and the scale of the farm expanded to 770 acres. In 2020, my niece was admitted to university. During her summer vacation, the whole family went out for half a month. When we got back, I felt like I finally let out the pent-up breath I'd been suppressing. I went to my brother, sister-in-law, and my sister and brother-in-law's grave and had a good cry. This was the first time I cried in front of the graves. Those who loved me since childhood, my siblings, died and it cost me half of my life. Previously, I did not dare to cry in front of them. I was afraid that if I cried, I would become the child who never grows up in front of them and fails to support this family.